welcome to episode 100, 100 of Velvet Al Watches Movies So You Don't Have To, which means I have watched 100 movies for you. Well, technically, I've watched 99 movies because this is the 100th movie. And it surprises me as much as it surprises you because I never thought I would stick with something this long, especially something no one cares about. And no one's like, wow, this is a super awesome podcast. We love you, Velvet Al. But I kept at it, kept watching terrible movies and rambling on about them. What the fuck was that? There was some noise. Um, and I think it was probably one of my cats. I'm not sure what it was, but I'm 99% sure it was one of my cats. So, but back to the podcast, which is what you really care about. Actually, you probably care more about my cats than... So, I am watching Empire Records. And the reason I chose chose this for my 100th episode, uh, my old therapist, when I told her that I was starting a podcast where I watch bad movies, she said, you have to watch Empire Records for it. And the thing is, because my whole thing is I'm doing movies I haven't seen before so that I could get like that just reaction of like, what the fuck is going on or not knowing what's going to happen. But I'm going to break that rule, because I have seen Empire Records before, but since this is the 100th episode, I should do this in honor of my therapist. And it's been a long time since I've seen this movie. I don't think I've seen it since it first came out. So I don't really remember much other than Liv Tyler strips down to her underwear, which is fantastic. But I think the rest of the movie probably sucked. Because I don't really remember much about it. <laughs> Just that Liv Tyler strips down to her in underwear. And that was fantastic. And I, I love the movie for that. Because um, that was the closest we got at that time. Uh, she later did do some movies with nudity. And that was even more fantastic. And Stealing Beauty actually is a good film. At, with the added bonus of... Liv Tyler nudity. So, Empire Records is not as good as Stealing Beauty because it's not a good movie and we don't get full Liv Tyler nudity. We just get her in, a, in, in her underwear. Um, I never worked at a record shop, but I've always heard from people who have that this movie is nowhere near what it actually is to be in a record store, to work at a record store. So, essentially, Empire Records is to record stores what Backdraft was to firefighters. Because firefighters hate Backdraft. They're like, what kind of bullshit is this film? This is not what being a firefighter is like. And people had the same reaction to Empire Records. But some people love it. They're like, oh, it's great. Um, I think really they just like the soundtrack. The soundtrack and Liv Tyler in her underwear. So, but I, I will press play and I will see... If there's anything else good about this movie other than the soundtrack and Liv Tyler in her underwear. We start off with the stoner kid from Dazed and Confused. Uh, man, that was such a good movie. And I feel like this kind of wants to be Dazed and Confused. Because you got the stoner kid and you got Renee Zellweger who's kind of like Joey Lauren Adams. And is one of the London brothers in this? Wait, no, Renee Zellweger was in Days and Confused. What I'm getting confused with is Mallrats. Because Mallrats had another London brother, and it had Joey Lauren Adams, who is kind of like Renee Zellweger. But Empire Records wants to be the 90s version of Days and Confused, I guess. Because we start off with the stoner kid, but he's got short hair this time. And he's counting the money for the record store, counting it twice, as the boss told him to do, uh, just to get... Um, how much they made during the day, which apparently was $9,000, which I think was that day or was it like for the week? Because um, 9000 does sound like a lot. And you got to remember, this is 1990s money. So 9000 is roughly like $10 billion these days. 
So he counts it, and he's just hanging out in the office after he counts the money and puts it away, and he finds some paperwork. Oh, no. It looks like Empire Records, the record store they work at. I don't know if I mentioned that. Um, but, yeah, that's, that's why it's called Empire Records. It'd be kind of weird if, you know, the record store wasn't named Empire Records and the new record store that's the monolith buying out the record store wasn't Empire Records because then you'd be like, what the fuck is Empire Records? So, but he finds paperwork showing that uh, it's going to be bought out by this big monolith. And remember that? Remember, like, that was a big thing in, like, the 90s, like, mom and pop record stores just being bought up by, like, Media Play and shit and Circuit City and all these. Um, Well, Circuit City was more like a big box appliance store that sold CDs to try to get you into the store. Be like, hey, get the CD cheap. Meanwhile, while you're there, why not buy this big TV and a washing machine? Oh, you kids don't know how ridiculously glorious the 90s were for this type of shit. Um, but yeah, you know, big chains like M, <clears throat> M, <laughs> Media Play and FYE just would storm into town and be like, fuck all y'all, we're gonna sell these CDs for cheaper because we can get them for cheaper because we can order a lot of them. And so you mom and pop independent stores, you're shit out of luck. So, but Stoner Kid, he's like, I can't let this be. We need money, so I'm going to go to Atlantic City, I think. I was going to say Vegas, and then I'm like, well, where is this record store located that he could ride his motorcycle to Vegas? But he passes by a Trump casino, and I'm pretty sure those are in Atlantic. Atlantic City, so yeah, I could see Empire Records being in, like, New Jersey or something, uh, so yeah, it's plausible that he drives to Atlantic City, because he's gonna win lots of money so that he can buy the record store, well, not buy the record store, but keep the record store in business, which seems like a good plan, but if the record store isn't making enough money to begin with, that they have to sell to, like, the fr big franchise making a lot of money right now is gonna buy them like a year at best um because the trend of cds sales is going downward actually it hasn't yet uh mp3s aren't a thing yet but indie stores are just kind of screwed over by the big franchises so he goes, and he goes to the craps table and puts it all. And it's like, oh, dude, you don't bet it all at once. What the fuck? And he rolls the dice and gets a seven. So now he's got $18,000. And instead of quitting while he's ahead, he bets it all again. You quit while you're ahead. Don't you realize casinos are fucking rigged to make sure you don't win money? So... Whenever you get the small chance of winning money, take it and run. But no, he's like, I got the seven first time. I can do it again. And snake eyes, which means you lose. So I know seven, you win. And like double ones, you lose. All the other combinations, do you win partial money? I don't know. I don't know the rules of craps. All I know is seven, because it's a lucky number, and you win. And snake eyes, because that's what everyone always says. Snake eyes! Not the guy from G.I. Joe. The next morning, this stoner kid. He isn't a stoner in this film, but I'm going to keep referring to him as the stoner kid. Because that's the only thing I know him from, is being the stoner kid in Dazed and Confused. But he's passed out on his motorcycle next to the shop, and a couple of the employees stop by, and they're like, Hey, what's happening? Like, oh, uh, yeah, it was Atlantic City. I lost a lot of money. Hey, bye, guys. It was nice knowing you. And they're like, huh, that was kind of weird. Oh, hey, wait a minute. He closed the store last night. Man, now he has no money. This isn't good. 
And the owner, he comes in, and he's all pissed off because it's Rex Manning Day. Um, yeah, I forgot. Rex Manning, the asshole rock star that Liv Tyler strips down to his, her underwear for. Um, oh, I can't wait for that scene. I can't wait for that scene. That is such a fantastic scene. I love that scene. I, You know, I'm watching that on my HD 4K TV. I don't even know if this movie is, like, streaming in 4K. But I hope so. Just, oh, Liv Tyler in her underwear. See, already, I'm not even paying attention or caring about this movie. Because my focus is on Liv Tyler in her underwear. Um, Oh, and yeah, so far, like, the soundtrack is pretty good. Um, I've forgotten who does any of these songs. Uh, well, we got Hendrix doing Hey Joe, like... Because the owner's name is Joe, so, you know, Hey, Joe, where are you going with that gun in your hand? Except the record store owner doesn't have a gun that I'm aware of. But, you know, he takes a call, and he's like, grumble, grumble, grumble. Whatever the call was, it was a very bad call. And then he goes, and he looks in the safe or wherever they keep the money, and sees that there's no money! And he yells for the stoner kid who's not around. And he's like, Grrr! Now, Renee Zellweger picks up Liv Tyler while Jim Blossoms is on the radio. Until I hear it from you. Which is, like, one of their best songs. Which is really saying something, because they have, like, three good songs? Four. Four good songs! I I'm going to say, um, no, five. I'm willing to go up to six songs <laughs> that the Jim Blossoms have. I mean, obviously, Till I Hear It From You, great song. Hey, Jealousy, great song. Found Out About You, great song. Um, Until I Fall Away, good song. Allison Road. Decent song. Day job. Decent song. So, there, yeah. They have six songs that I can stand listening to. But, yeah, so uh, Liv Tyler has made some muffins or cupcakes. I think cupcakes because they got frosting. But you can frost a muffin. And really, isn't a cupcake just a frosted muffin? Think about that one. But so she's made cupcakes because she's all excited. It's Rex Manning Day, and she's going to throw herself at Rex Manning. Because, um, yeah, that's when she strips down to her underwear later. One of the greatest scenes in film history. Um, top 1,000 scenes. <laughs> um, if she went fully naked, then it'd be top 20. But so she's all excited, and they go to the store, and... There's Liv Tyler, Renee Zellweger, Shaggy Hair Douchebag, and Curly Hair Douchebag. Oh, and Shaggy Hair Douchebag, like, talked to the owner. He's like, I'm going to tell Liv Tyler I love her, but I don't know how to say it. And the owner's like, tell her you love her. It's that simple. Which, yeah, it really is that simple. Um, except for the fact that, you know, she wants to bang Rex Manning instead. Um, but no, go ahead, Shaggy Hair Douchebag. And so uh, the employees have this way of, with M&M's, whoever gets the right color M&M, uh, gets to pick the music for the day. And Curly Hair Douchebag gets it. And everyone's like, oh, no. So I'm expecting Curly Hair Douchebag to have, like, the worst music taste. Or possibly the best music taste. And everyone else is just a douchebag with bad music taste. So he puts on the song that is kind of a replacements ripoff. I'm not quite sure. Um, I quickly checked the Wikipedia page. So it was the Dirt Clods. Don't know anything about them. Um, but everyone is singing along to it. Or at least Liv Tyler and Renee Zellweger are singing along to it. So why were they so upset that Curly Hair Douchebag got the rights to play the music? When they when he played a music that they liked, but Shaggy Hair Douchebag doesn't like it, and apparently 
he had veto power, so he vetoed it and put something else on. I don't know what song it is. Because it cut, well, it cut to commercial. <laughs> and it comes back, and it's a completely different scene. So I guess I'm going to have to wait to find out what song that shaggy haired douchebag thinks is better than this replacement's ripoff. Now, the owner asks Liv Tyler, like, what are you doing here? You're not scheduled to work until later in the afternoon. And she's like, but it's Rex Manning Day. And the owner's like, Rex Manning. Fucking Rex Manning. But of course, because, you know, she wants to bang Rex Manning, so she has to be there to see Rex Manning. And then we uh, watch the video for Rex Manning's song, which... You know, is theoretically supposed to be, like, bad and cheesy because he's, like, some bad, cheesy 80s artist. But it's really not that bad. <laughs> um, I, I kind of dig it. I, you know what? I think I might buy a Rex Manning CD. I, if I came into the record store for Rex Manning Day and that CD was playing and there was, like, a discount on the Rex Manning CD, I'd be like... You know what? Yeah. Sure, I'll I'll buy it at 75% off. And this is being played in the record store, obviously to pump up people for Rex Manning Day, I guess. Um, or this is what Shaggy Hair Douchebag put on. He vetoed fucking replacements knockoff for this? I don't know. I guess I will never know what shaggy hair douchebag chose for his veto. But Rex Manning Day. Okay, um, damn it, I waited too long to <laughs> start recording again because now I forget like half of what happened. Um, Robin Tunney shows up and she's full on goth punk. She's not full on goth, but she's goth ish. Which is what happens when you hang out with Feruza Bulk on the set of The Craft. Is just, you're gonna go all goffy. I don't know, did this or The Craft come first? Craft was a pretty good movie. Um, I'm not gonna lie. I, I did watch the remake slash sequel type whatever it was for this podcast. And that was awful. But the original Craft, I will say I did enjoy that. That was a... Good film. Much better than the 20 minutes so far of Empire Records. But she uh, comes in and doesn't talk to anyone, just flips everyone off and walks into the back room. Meanwhile, um, oh yeah, the stoner dude from Days and Confused comes back. And he's got a bucket of quarters. And he's like, oh, hey guys, what's up? And of course the owner is like, um, yeah, where's the money? There was $9,000 supposed to be deposited in the bank. It's not there. Um, shit's about to go down. And he's like, oh, yeah, the money's in Atlantic City. And it might be in other cities that, by this point because someone might have won it and gone to a different city and taken the money. And the owner's like, um... Yeah, you sit right here until you figure out a way to get $9,000 back. Meanwhile, uh, Shaggy Hair Douchebag is gluing quarters to the floor. Because, dude, that is what Gen X is all about. We do stuff like glue quarters to the floor. Why? Just because we're extreme. I hate this guy. I Fucking hate the, I fucking hate his shaggy hair haircut. I hate that he's gonna try to make moves on Liv Tyler when she's supposed to be mine. And I hate his shaggy hair haircut. I hate it so much that I'm bringing it up twice. So in the bathroom, Robin Tunney is staring at the mirror, and she decides, "Fuck this! I am shaving all my hair off." Which, right on, sister. And this. It's supposed to be like an emotional scene, I think, which might have landed with something if we knew her character for longer than like 30 seconds. 
by because to contrast, the Royal Tenenbaums, much 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 better movie than this, um, and maybe uh, Wes Anderson watched this movie and he's like, this is a good scene, but it could be done a lot better if we cared about the character. So if you remember in the Royal Tenenbaums, uh, after Luke Wilson gets goes kind of crazy and tries to kill himself. By the way, Robin Tunney tried to kill herself. She's got a uh, bandage around her wrist. Which I feel like, if I kind of remember correctly, I think it wasn't actually like a suicide attempt. It was some sort of accident, and she's just trying to play it off as, ooh, I tried to kill myself. Although, didn't Robin Tunney try to kill herself in the craft like when she first like arrives to the school, doesn't she have like a bandage on her wrist or like a scar in the wrist because she tried to kill herself and killed herself the right way because you're supposed to cut along the vein, not across. Um, am I supposed to? I'm not supposed to say that, am I? No, I'm not encouraging you to kill yourself. I am just pointing out that that is considered the proper way because that is the way that's actually going to open up the veins and let you bleed to death. Which, again, do not do. But that'd be kind of crazy, wouldn't it, if, like, Robin Tunney, like, her two big roles involve, like, slitting her wrist open. I should look into that, but I'm not going to. But more to my point, um, that scene, like, in Royal Tenenbaums, like, we've gotten to know Luke Wilson's character, and we're invested, and we realize, oh my god, he's just kind of reached, like, rock bottom, aided by the fact that the soundtrack is playing Elliot Smith's Needle in the Hay, which is a fantastic song, so... I've already forgotten what song Robin Tunney's shaving her head to. So, again, it, the scene just doesn't have an emotional impact, and it probably wouldn't bug me if not for the fact that Royal Tenenbaums would later do that scene, like, a thousand times better. And she walks out with their shaved head, and she doesn't want to, like, talk to people of what's going on, and shaggy hair douchebag sees the bandage down her wrist, like, what's going on?! You have so much to live for, like me. I am the savior. Because, you know, he, she doesn't want to, you know, talk. And Stoner Dude is like, because now he's all like mystic. Like, I am super zen now because I lost all that money. I lost $9,000 in Atlantic City. And Shaggy Hair Douchebag is like, you changed, man. Meanwhile, curly haired douchebag has put some suicidal tendencies on the c- <laughs> CD, or not on the CD, on the sound system. Which, again, why is everyone hating on this guy for having gotten the MMs to choose the music for the day? Put on some fucking suicidal tendencies, which then causes, like, the customers to start moshing. I. Don't know. Um, Maybe the music stores I've been to don't have quite the same clientele as uh, Empire Records apparently does. I have never seen a mosh pit break out at a record store. I'm just pointing that out. But of course, so Renee Zellweger pulls her veto card. Because she's like, ah, we can't have this shit going on because people are going to fucking trash the place while they're moshing. Which is, okay, that is a good point. So, okay, I, I can understand the veto on this point. And then the pizza guy shows up. I think he's a pizza guy. Or maybe he's an employee there. I don't know. He's wearing a shirt that looks like it's a pizzeria shirt. And he goes up to curly-haired douchebag and like, I made you a mixtape, man. And I made you some pizza. So he, I don't think he was, like, delivering pizza. He just came by and had made some food. 
So is there a queer subtext here? Or is this just, you know, platonic male bonding love? Because I would think at this point in the 90s, you would just have an out and out gay character to, you know, really hit home with Generation X. So I don't think they would have like, but, you know, maybe big movie studios are still kind of like, I don't know if we could have a queer. No, they because they would have a token queer guy just out there. So I'm going to say that Empire Records is making the brave move of showing platonic male bonding love by having a guy make a mixtape for another guy. So you earned an extra point, Empire Records, for something I'm not even sure you actually did. And then everyone's just kind of having fun, and now they put on the Flying Lizards version of Money, um, which I think is kind of like the best uh, version of that song. You know, it's like completely deadpan, like, that's what I want. The best things in life are free. You can give them to the birds and bees. And... I like it. I, I I like that version of money. And because, you know, um, Stoner Kid went and blew all the money. So he wants money. And the boss, I thought he was the owner, but no, he's just the boss. He's like, yeah, fuck this shit. I know you guys are having fun. Well, here's some fun. Here's your new uniforms and the code of conduct. Because this place is going to get sold to a music chain and... I had raised enough money to try to buy my way in and buy out Empire Records and own it, but idiot here went and blew the money at Atlantic City, which he did with, like, good intentions. And had he just, you know, stopped and made the 18000 would have been gravy, man. Would have been gravy. But, you know... It, since it wasn't your money, dude, it is something you should have talked over with him first. So the employees are reading over all the new rules, and they're not happy about it. They're like, what kind of bullshit is this? Fuck these rules. And, you know, they don't have time for this because they got to get the store ready for Rex Manning Day. Putting up all the banners and the tables, and shouldn't they have done this before the store opened? Just, I mean, I don't know. I've never managed a store or even worked at a store where there was. I never worked at a store, period. But I never worked at a store where they, you know, had like a big guest showing up. So I don't know of how like the whole like tables and setting up. But I would think that you would want that set up already beforehand. Because I have gone to some autograph signings, and they generally do have everything set up. Then again, I've never... Well, no, I did go before Chris Benoit showed up. Yes, I got Chris Benoit's autograph before he killed his family and killed himself. So obviously it had to have been before that, because, you know, I didn't take his corpse and, like, sign it. That would be crazy. Zombie Chris Benoit is here to autograph your picture. Where was... <laughs> Something happened in this movie, right? I don't know. I, the, times I, the times I have the most fun <laughs> with this podcast is when I just get so fucking sidetracked because I can't give... Because I don't give, like, two shits about the movie. I give one shit. I give one shit about this movie, but I don't give two shits about it. And that's that's as good as you're going to get from me, Empire Records. Um, you're going to have to work very hard to get that second shit out of me. But so, you know, they're getting prepared. Meanwhile, there's this, like, little kid who's shoplifting and super obvious about it. And Stoner guy is like, yeah, not on my watch. And he chases after him and catches him. And they're going to 
They call the cops, so eventually the cops are going to come and bust his ass. Meanwhile, Renee Zellweger, to just kind of be a bitch about everything, is taking her clothes off and put on just the apron that the employees are going to have to wear once this switches over to the franchise. And I had forgotten about this scene. And my God, she is fucking hot as hell. <laughs> this is... This is my new fantasy now. Just a woman wearing just an apron of a music franchise store. Well, she's got panties on. You can see panties, but she's not wearing a bra. Because it's covered up by the apron, but... Or is it considered a smock? I don't know. Whatever. I don't care about semantics like that. She's just looking hot. So, I guess I'm going to raise up to one and a half shits I give about this movie. <laughs> and they're all having fun and laughing like, ooh And then Rex Manning walks in with his manager and, awkward! Oh, I thought this was going to be a professional place. Dude, you're working at like a, you're going to a small time indie record shop. I don't even this doesn't even feel like an indie record shop. It's just a low-level corporate record shop. Like, we want to be media play. We just aren't as famous. So, we're, we're media play. We just have no dress code or really, like, employee handbook. Now Rex Manning is setting up, and he sits down, and he's signing autographs, and he isn't too happy because everyone's come for his autograph. is uh, fairly old, at least in her late 40s and 50s, except there was this one young girl, and he was excited. And like, oh, no, this is for my mom. I've never even heard of you. Like, oh, ouch, you're just not famous anymore, Rex Manning. But I do have to question, I mean, did he get a facelift or something? Because he looks younger than the people getting an autograph. And shouldn't he be older? Because if in his heyday, he appealed to teenage girls then shouldn't they have grown up but still be younger than him? I don't know. Maybe he's just had a good plastic surgeon and he's like 60. And in the back room, uh, the shoplifter, he's acting all weird, but that consciously weird thing that where you want people to look at you and go, wow, he's weird, so he must be interesting. You're like, no, you're not, dude. And stoner guy is like, dude, look at what you shoplifted. You got a lot of rap and a lot of metal. And you got Whitney Houston. And he's all like, it's for my girlfriend. Um, I was half expecting him to say, like, yeah, she lives in Canada. But, you know, admit the truth. It doesn't matter what you shoplifted, because you're fucking gonna sell it. And get, like, the store credit, at least. Or, wouldn't that be some shit? Just sell it back to the store you stole it from. No, you're gonna go down to, like, Frisbee's and trade it in. I'm sure in this area, where Empire Records is, like, they have, like, used CD stores that you can trade in your CDs. So, yeah, shoplifting Whitney Houston does make sense, even if you're a rap metalhead. And meanwhile, Rex Manning's um, manager is like, so, do you guys like the new Rex Manning record? And they're like, <laughs> yeah, we didn't listen to it. And she's like, but it's been polling high among teenage males. And Stoner Guy's like, have you cross-referenced to see um, how high of percentage of those males are homosexuals? He says homosexuals. 
which oh, good old fashioned 90s gay bashing humor. Which, I mean, I guess you could argue it's not really gay bashing, but it's gay bashing. Because, get it? The joke is that only a homosexual would like Rex Manning. That means Rex Manning sucks and isn't cool. Which is wrong. Because the homosexuals are on the cutting edge of fashion and art and music. It was the homosexuals who first told us the Pesh Mode is awesome. And we all went and uh, what we checked it out and go, wow, these guys are right. The Pesh Mode is fucking awesome. So I rest my case based on just that one band that, I don't <laughs> that, you know, teenage girls and homosexual males told us is an awesome band and they were correct. Now, a burnout douchebag comes in, and he's also an employee. God, how many employees does this store have? No wonder they gotta fucking sell it to, like, the music chain. I don't think they sell enough records to be able to pay all of these people. But he goes by, he's like, hey, where's uh, Robin Tunney? Like, ah, yeah, she shaved her head and tried to kill herself. No biggie. And then she, he looks at the Rex Manning's assistant, like, who are you? I'm Rex Manning's assistant. And he laughs like, oh, Rex Manning, he's such a douche. And she's like, that's it, I quit. I don't think she tells Rex Manning that she quit, but she does tell the boss, Joe, the boss of the record store, like, yeah, I quit. And Joe's just like, I can't take this. I'm going to go play drums because I've got a drum set in my office. Wow. You know, you thought, like, companies, like, Silicon Valley companies, like, Google and all that, are all, like, wow, they're crazy. They have, like, all these slides and whatever playgrounds they put in their office to have fun. But apparently back in the 90s, record stores let you have a drum kit. And he starts drumming along to ACDC. If you want blood! You got it! It's a fucking awesome tune. Um, I think it's got, like... It's tied for my favorite ACDC song. Alongside, like, 50 other ACDC songs. Um, yeah, pretty much the entire... <laughs> the entire Bon Scott era. And, like, three of the... Brian Johnson albums, plus scattered singles off of the rest of the Brian Johnson albums, are all tied for my favorite ACDC song. But as much as awesome that ACDC is, you know, they're playing it through a store and everyone's bopping their head, and Liv Tyler and Renee Zellweger are singing along to it. And again, ACDC's fucking awesome, but I don't quite buy that everyone would be bopping their head. 98% of the people, yes, because ACDC is awesome, and they should fully be bopping their head and singing along. Liv Tyler's character just does not strike me as the type to listen to ACDC. Renee Zellweger's character, who they've kind of made out to be a complete slut, that's not me. They, like, all, like, they don't even heavily insinuate it. They pretty much come out and say it. Well, if she's a slut, I think, like, on her own, she might not have listened to ACDC, but she's probably banged a lot of guys that were listening to ACDC at the time. Something else happened. Oh, yeah, and then the actual owner of the store comes by. because He's like, yeah, you know, the money still hasn't been deposited, so... I'm just swinging by to pick it up and drop it off at the bank. And, of course, they don't have the money. So, quickly, Joe uh, just shoves a bunch of papers into a bag, uh, like a pouch. Like, oh, yeah, here you go. Here's the money. And, luckily, because the owner is, like, just a complete douche. But a different kind of douche. He's a corporate douche. 
He's like, yeah, I figure it's all there. I'm not going to take it out and count it right now. So he's going to go off to the bank. So they've bought themselves like an hour. And maybe for the rest of the day. I don't know how long before this guy's going to actually go to the bank to deposit the money and see, oh, this isn't money. This is just a bunch of random papers. So a burnout douchebag goes up to Robin Tunney and is like, do you need help? Like, why'd you do this? And she's like, it has nothing to do with you. So I'm guessing, you know, they're dating and he feels guilty because, you know, his massive cock did not cure her from depression. I don't know if he has a massive cock. He might have a tiny cock, but even a tiny cock should be able to cure her of depression, right? Um, yeah, you can't save everyone, you know, if someone, someone is going through depression, you gotta let them know you're there for them, but you can't force them into, like, you know, opening up to you, because then you're just kind of playing the hero, and people don't want that, like, oh, you think you can save me of everyone, So he's kind of like, okay, well, I got my guitar, so I'm going to go jam in the back room. And the police show up to take away Shoplifter. um, And then I think there's a couple other scenes where something might have happened. Oh, yeah. uh, Curly or douchebag. Um, There's this girl who's listening to music on a headphone, like one of those listening stations. And he comes up behind her and, you know... He's trying to kiss her, but she, like, starts dancing and accidentally hits him. I hope he knows her. Because that is kind of fucked up to just kind of go up to someone in public and decide, I'm going to kiss you. Yeah, it. I think even in the 90s, that wasn't okay. Unless you were, like, super hot or super big rock star. But you're just a curly-haired douchebag who works at a record store. You're definitely not getting away with just randomly kissing girls. But who cares about all that? Because now we're up to the greatest scene in this movie. Liv Tyler takes Rex Manning to his lunch. He's off in some room somewhere. And, you know, he's kind of like, oh, you can go now. But she's like... I used to dream of marrying you. And she strips down to her underwear. And it's like, oh, yes. I I love you, Liv Tyler. And Rex Manning's like, you sure you want to do this? And she's like, yes. And then he unzips his pants and is like, let's rock and roll. And something snaps off in her. And she goes running out of the room crying. Um, did you not expect him to actually, like, go through with it? Or were you expecting him to, like, romance you first? (laughs) Like, you, I'm not, like, gonna victim blame, but you stripped down to your underwear. So you had to have expected something that he was gonna be, like, just complete perv and, like, okay. Suck my dick now. So maybe he just kind of went about it wrong and should have been like, okay, let me eat you out first. And then she would have been like, okay. Or was she expecting him to go like, now that I see you in your underwear, will you marry me? Um, I don't know. I hope she gives her explanation for... Which, granted, yes, I'm glad you're not banging Rex Manning. Because you should bang me instead. Um, But I know that's not a possibility. And plus you're married to the singer from Space Hog. So. And you guys seem happily in love. Whatever happened to Space Hog? Why aren't they still around like rocking out? They were a good band. Chinese album. Fucking rocks. And we just all kind of turned our back on them. So, America, I hold you personally responsible. So now, 
I'm going to go check up if Space Hog has any further albums. Because I'm just as responsible and guilty if they have further albums and I have not done my due diligence to help keep Re- Space Hog a popular band. So it is just as much my fault as it is yours. So Liv Tyler's crying on the rooftop and Shaggy Hair Douchebag comes up and he's as I have to let you know, I love you. And she's like, I just threw myself at Rex, man. I can't deal with this right now. And she goes running off. And she goes see Renee Renee Zellweger. And she's like, I can't do this. I'm not a slut like you. And Renee Zellweger's like, fuck you. I'm not a slut. So she goes off and sees Rex Manning and pulls him into the back room and bangs him. Because... She's not a slut, so she has to prove she's not a slut by being slutty, I guess. Or it's just one of those, like, I'm so angry, I'm going to do this because I hate myself. And whatever, I don't care, but the soundtrack is blasting uh, Edwin Collins' A Girl Like You, which is a fantastic song. Seriously, I will give this movie props on the soundtrack. The soundtrack is good. Never met a girl like you before. Me, 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 me. Um, and then Liv Tyler goes to Shaggy Hair Douchebag and like, uh, I'm, I'm sorry. It's just I've never thought of you that way. And he's like, Yeah, well, fuck you. Well, he doesn't say fuck you, but he storms off. And Robin Tunney's handing out pins that she made. Uh, not pins, buttons. Button pins. And Shaggy Hair Douchebag's like, let's dance! And he puts on some Rex Manning. And they start dancing. And everyone in the store just starts dancing because, wow, what a magical, fantastic store where everyone dances. Um, I want the douchebags from High Fidelity instead. The movie version. Um, Because they're douchebags, but they were entertaining douchebags. That kind of had some good points, too, about music. But Joe comes out, and he's mad because he sees everyone dancing and having fun. Because he's not having fun, because his money is gone, and the record store is going to be gone. And he grabs the stoner kid from Days and Confused and takes him in the back room and just beats the shit out of him. Then everyone realizes that Renee Zellweger is uh, banging Rex Manning in the back room. Um, And uh, they're all kind of waiting there like, "Eh, this is going to be awkward. And Pizza Guy shows up and he's like, oh, sorry, I'm late. And does he work there? Does everyone fucking work there? I don't know. I don't know if he's the pizza. He's just kind of because he says, like, sorry, I'm late. Late for what? Late delivering the pizza? And then Liv Tyler comes in and he's like, Ah, I'm going home. I'm not feeling well. And at that moment, Renee Zellweger and Rex Manning come out of the room, uh, you know, fixing their clothes because they just fucked. And Shaggy Hair Douchebag is like, I'll kill you! And he lunges... Well, he doesn't say I'll kill you. That would have been great if he did. But he lunges at Rex Manning... And Rex Manning sucker punches him. But why? Why is he mad at Rex Manning? Rex Manning didn't fuck the girl you love. He fucked a different girl. And it's not like... Well, I guess Liv Tyler kind of, you know, mischaracterized the situation. Because I guess she did make it sound like, you know, he made her feel like a fool... So it kind of sounds like, oh, he just, you know, rejected her. No, he was down to fuck. She was the one that ran out on him. And she made the first move. So as much of a scumbag Rex Manning is and deserves to be punched, he doesn't be deserve to be punched by you for the reasons that you're punching him. And then Liv Tyler gets mad at Renee Zellweger for fucking Rex Manning. And, oh, Joe kicks Rex Manning out of the store. He's like, get out of my store! 
And he's like, fine, where's my assistant? She quit. Yeah, whatever, fuck all of you. And leaves. And Liv Tyler's yelling at Renee Zellweger, like, oh, you just gotta fuck everyone. Which again, you chose not to fuck Rex Manning. So he's fair game. If Renee Zellweger wants to fuck Rex Manning, there, there's no hoe code, like the bro code. <laughs> uh, yeah. Well, you know what I say, sisters before fisters. So, but yeah, if she wants to fuck Rex Manning, you passed on Rex Manning. So she is in free and clear. But she's yelling, and then Renee Zellweger's like, Yeah, but you're a speed freak! And throws the pills at uh, Liv Tyler. And now I'm getting, like, just flashbacks of that Saved by the Bell episode where Jesse Spano was, like, just taking caffeine pills and because she needed to be up all night to get her schoolwork done while preparing and whatever, dancing or... I don't even remember what it was she was going to become famous for it. She was saying, I'm so excited. I'm so excited. I'm so scared. And it would have been fantastic if we got something like that here, but no, we just got yelling and then Liv Tyler tries to destroy the store, but they stop her and Robin Tunney shoves her head into like a sink full of water to calm her down. Calm her down. Now, while she pees, Robin Tunney, Robin Tunney's the one peeing, tells Liv Tyler, is that really how you wanted to lose your virginity, seriously, to some has-been rock star in the back room of a record store? And Liv Tyler realizes, yeah, that kind of was a bad idea. Meanwhile, curly-haired douchebag has some pop brownies and starts fantasizing about playing guitar with Guar, and then he gets eaten by the giant worm thing, which, you know, is uh, his dream, apparently. And isn't it all our dreams to get eaten by the giant worm in the Guar stage show? It's my dream. Well, it is now. Then Rex Manning's former manager stops by and she asked Joe out to dinner and like, okay, yeah, sure. Let's do that. Cause my life's ruined anyhow. So let's go out to dinner later. And then Liv Tyler gets the idea. Hey, let's hold the fake funeral for Robin Tunney. And she'll realize that she's loved or something. I don't know what the idea was, but just so she could experience her own funeral, which I think is good, right? Everyone should get to experience what their funeral would be like and what people would say. Like, you know, you're dead and then you, all these people cry about how much they care about you and it does you no good because you're dead. So, yeah, at least uh, they do the fake funeral. Except it's a very terrible funeral because everyone just talks about their own, like, needs and wants and don't really talk about... <laughs> Robin Tunney, because uh, even though this was supposed to make be about how, you know, they care about her, uh, let's whine about ourselves, and then Liv Tyler and Renee Zellweger make up, and they both still, like, love each other, platonically. And then Robin Tunney takes off her bandage, and you know, the scar isn't very much of a scar, because she tried to kill herself with a Bic Lady razor, disposable pink razor, and it didn't get very far. And I think everyone just realizes, you know, we love each other. We love the store. This bond will just... Something. I don't care anymore. Just get to the end of this movie already. Now the shoplifter comes back with a gun, threatening to shoot up the place. Because he's just so mad. And... Robin Tunney comes out and just walks up to him because she's got a deaf wish. So she's all like, talk to me and blah, blah, blah. And he's all like, you're all crazy. And 
so cool. I wish I could work at the record shop. And they're like, is that really what it's all about? No, maybe. So the police come again and cart him off. And But they tell him, like, don't worry. When you get out of jail or out of juvie because you're underage, there will be a job waiting for you. No one tell him that the store is being sold off. And But then curly-haired douche has a brilliant idea. You know what? This is the last night. Let's just have a big old party. And while the ple- the news report is trying to cover the story, he jumps there like, yeah, I want to talk about it. I was there. Everything happened. Big party. Come on down. And, of course, everyone comes down down because the entire town loves this record shop. Like, it's not just, like, the cool kids. Like, little old ladies are lining up for this party for the record store. Um, yeah, because Empire Records is such a cool store. And they sell stuff, and they get kegs, and they raise the $9,000 and probably dent some. And corporate douche who comes down to say, what's going on? Grr, you can't do this. And everyone's like, well, we quit. And then he realizes, I don't want to run a fucking record store. Whatever. Joe, you can buy it. And everyone lives happily ever after, right? And big party and Liv Tyler and shaggy hair douche realize they're in love and... Then there's music playing, and then we had Jim Blossoms. Do I hear it from you? And then over the credits, uh, the pizza guy and curly haired douche are talking about Primus and how Primus isn't as good as the Pixies, which I agree with. And then in the credits, it says Tobey Maguire was in this. What the fuck? He was. I didn't notice him, but I looked it up online for like 30 seconds because I didn't feel like going too deep into it, but I guess he got cut out or something. I don't know. Sometimes it happens. People get cut out and must be like late into the movie making because then their name is still in the credits, even though they don't appear in the film. And it's kind of weird. Like the movie, the campaign, Miz. WWE superstar The Miz is in the credits, but his scene was cut. So I remember when I saw that in the credits, I'm like, what the fuck was The Miz in this movie? But yeah, everyone lives happily ever after, including me, because the movie's over now. So I can continue on with my life. 100 fucking episodes. I don't know how I haven't had an aneurysm yet. Maybe I should quit while I'm ahead. (laughs) Learn the lesson that the guy didn't learn at the beginning of this film of quit while you're ahead. I should quit while I'm ahead. But I probably will continue to watch more bad movies. Uh, But at least Liv Tyler was in her underwear. There was that. Velvet Al at Hotmail.com if you want to shoot me a line or leave a comment in the comment section if you're on YouTube. Until next time, if there is a next time, I love you all.